Okay. I just started recording. Welcome, David. Hello. Um, here today, I have David Catling from University of Washington, Seattle. He is um, an astrobiologist and a planetary scientist working on origins of life, planetary atmospheres, and astrobiology. Uh, how are you, David, today? I'm fine, thanks. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. It's a very sunny day today in Boston. Um, yeah. And in Seattle, it's uh, living up to its reputation. It's mm -hmm. raining. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> right. I, I heard that it's like rainy for like two weeks or something, right? Um. Well, people say it rains a lot in Seattle, but actually the summers are not too bad. They In the three months of summer, July, August, September, it can be dry and clear blue skies, sunshine. But okay. I like to, I, Seattle people like to keep that secret. So <laughs> not too many people okay. come here. And some people say it rains a lot in the winter or sometimes all the time. Yeah. Uh, but in fact, the rain often is very small. Like it's just a tiny okay. bit of drizzle. And so I sometimes say, you know, it doesn't rain in Seattle all the time. It just rains once from October okay. to <laughs> March. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it yeah that's it you just once <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah before before we go into serious stuff like how was your christmas like tell tell us about a little bit about the the exhibition that you've been oh uh, yeah i went to um i went to the uk uh yeah. and spent some time there it was a little dif difficult to get around because of uh, a train strike but um okay. i spent a little i spent basically a day in London, other other time I spent with family, but in London I went to the British Library, which okay. um, has I don't know how many millions of books they have, but a lot, and they also have famous historic documents uh, in their op open collection mm -hmm. on display for everybody. But they also had a exhibition about Alexander the Great, yeah. um, and also in particular it was focused on the mythology of this person in history. Uh, yeah. Because when you get people in ancient history, you know, you know something, but there's lots of stories and legends. And uh, in the yeah. medieval in the medieval times that grew into a big romance story. Um, yeah. So it's I, it was yeah. What are you like? I mean, I I I have two books on Alexander. One is the Plutarch's biography on him. The lives of Alexander, I think, yeah. and the other is like the Anabasis, which is more like a legend of him, right? Right. Um, but I guess like the the exhibition you've been to, as far as I understand from your email, was was mostly about this like medieval romance story. Well, there were some older artifacts like coins mm -hmm. from three hundred BC, which you know obviously is quite close in time to yeah. When Alexander lived, <clears throat> you know, but even those were in some senses mythological because they show Alexander with horns, right? Mm. He is described, I think, in the Quran as a two horned, two horned, yeah, person. So even even that time, there was still some mythology. Um, yeah. So yeah, I mean, Plutarch is, although it's it's relatively recent compared to when Alexander lived. It's still, it's still ancient by in comparison to some of the later descriptions of Alexander right. from the Middle Ages, for example, where where it's clearly just mythology. I mean, you have yeah. you have monsters, you have griffins, you, you have um, weird things happening that that just don't make any sense, like like the horse of uh, <clears throat> Alexander. Uh, seems to have a mind and be intelligent right <laughs> what was his he, name he's like, spectacular he's a character he's, right hmm? he is a, he, he's a character like what what's its name again it, um bucephalus is that how you pronounce it bucephalus okay okay yeah and, uh, and um yeah in in the in the alexander romance the medieval story you know Alexander is, is assumed to be murdered when he dies and we don't really know that there's some speculation about whether he was poisoned Mm -hmm. But then the horse, the horse who in tries the, to find the 
yeah the finds the murderer yeah. but in i think in the kind of uh un historical understanding the horse has been dead for some time <laughs> yeah when alexander died but in the romance the horse is still alive discovers the murderer tears him to pieces <laughs> yeah i mean it's it's just the it's just um elaborated the whole story <laughs> like yeah. things are just added which you know are over the top <laughs> but they make for a good story and i think in the medieval times people people love these crazy stories so. yeah <laughs> yeah that's amazing that's amazing i um so that was at a british museum right mm -hmm. yeah, yeah that's in, in central london but they had some the coins that i mentioned were artifacts which they had on loan from the british museum which has mm -hmm. that's the repository of many artifacts mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I I have one coin of Alexander. Did I show you that? Really? Is it from how old? Uh it's my estimate it's from the first century BC. Okay. Uh I got it from Jerusalem. And it's in pretty good condition. It's a silver uh, silver coin. It's it's called Tetra Draham. Uh-huh. Um and you can you you bought it? From, yeah, I bought it. From a street vendor. <laughs> um they were like I didn't know it's real. It might be fake. <laughs> I mean, they were like certified, you know, antique shop. Okay. And, um, they were in the old city of Jerusalem. And mm. um, I mean, there were like pictures of very famous people like Dan Brown or like Moshe Diane, like buying stuff from the same guy that I bought the jeweler from. He was an he was an Arabic guy and he he liked my name and like you had a like long chat and <laughs> Uh, well, he was he was trying to bring you in to buy things. Right, right, right. <laughs> no, I I bargained. I I, I use my Turkish bargaining skills. Okay, and and it's a it's a good coin. It's it's not only just a coin, but it's in like a it's like a medallion. Um, mm -hmm. so they probably put it in inside like a gold bezel, so you can actually wear it. And that's the only like coin I have. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> Well, um, okay, so let's get started. Like when, when we talk about stuff, we usually talk about like history, religion, art, rarely about origins of life. So right. today oh. we will change it. We will mainly talk about origins of life and okay. what you're doing. And um, you're no stranger to the Turkish youth. You have a book. Um translated into Turkish, which is originally published by Oxford University Press, the, the very short introduction series, right? It's titled Astrobiology. Yeah, I have a copy. Here it is. You do? Okay. Oh, I don't know whether the, the camera is not working for this. Right, right. Maybe you have to put it here. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes. I mean, I, I didn't buy the, I, I didn't buy the book. I, 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 I need a signed copy. <laughs> oh, yeah. So the, there is a, the Turkish version is a different color. Right. I think this is softback. The Turkish version is hardback, but uh -huh. yeah, it's supposed to be a good translation, but I don't yeah. know. Turkish, so. I, I don't know either. I, I will check it out. When I go to Turkey, I will, I will get a hold of a copy. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Let's, let's like, just briefly introduce yourself, David. You're right now at your professor at um, University of Washington at Seattle. You're, you're from the UK, you studied at Oxford, but like, just give a brief introduction of yourself. How did you start doing science? How was your career like? Okay, well, <clears throat> currently I am a professor in the Department of Earth and Space Sciences at the University of Washington. And the University of Washington also has a cross-campus program the astrobiology program, which involves 12 departments. And so I'm also part of that program. And before I came to the University of Washington, which is some time ago now, I worked at uh, NASA's Ames Research Center. So that's a NASA center <clears throat> located near San Francisco. And um, I worked there for six years. Mm -hmm. And basically, I I went there for a postdoc after my PhD, mm -hmm. uh, which I did, as you mentioned, um, in Oxford. And basically, I started 
in my PhD doing planetary science and uh, particularly about Mars. And when I went to work for NASA, um, I was working on projects mm -hmm. to do with Mars, but I started thinking about uh, what was Mars like when it was a young planet, mm -hmm. um, which is when people think life may have existed on Mars. Mm -hmm. And how do we how do we know what the environment was like then? How could we go to Mars and find samples that tell us something about the environment? So that's when I started thinking as a postdoc um, about the environment of the early Earth, because I thought, OK, we don't know much about Mars, but we know something about the Earth. So how do we know about the early Earth's environment? Could we use the same techniques that we use for Earth? to find out about Mars. And then I started reading a lot about mm -hmm. um, the Earth. And of course, when you're a, a young scientist and you sort of start something new, um, sometimes things don't make sense in the literature. Uh, you start reading and you think, OK, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> yeah. That didn't seem quite logical. Um, and so I started thinking of my own ideas because uh, some things I read, you know, they, they just seem like arguments that were not solid, right. not backed up by mathematics or any kind of models. They were just ideas. Mm -hmm. So um, I started doing a lot of work about the ancient earth and probably in the last 10, 20 years, I'd say half of my work has been about the ancient earth mm -hmm. and when i say the ancient earth i mean four three two billion years ago um the first half or first two-thirds of earth history mm -hmm. uh as a lot of people work in geology on things like dinosaurs but for me that's the recent past oh that's only 100 million years ago but i'm talking about a thousand or two thousand right. uh, million years ago um, and the world was very different back then. It was so different with, uh, if we go back three billion years ago, so different with no animals, no plants, that it was like another planet. The atmosphere was also very different. So I consider the early Earth to be part of planetary science because it's really another planet that we're talking about, the early Earth. Yeah. And, and you know, in recent years, I've been particularly concerned with the environment for the origin of life mm -hmm. um so that's how i how i sort of had this trajectory where i was starting doing planetary science but have ended ended up spending some time in the last six years thinking about the origin of life yeah so what's your background like what oh don't, you don't call it college but like what did you study in undergrad and what did you do in your phd well um so, so I grew up in England and in the British system, you have to decide quite early which direction you're going in, um, whether it's science or the humanities and the arts. Mm -hmm. And that happens about the age of 16, mm. you specialize. So when I was 16, I actually quite liked history. I think if I didn't, if I wasn't a scientist, I would have liked to have been a historian. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd also liked creative writing um, yeah. quite a lot. I actually was a runner-up in a national poetry competition when oh, I was really? in no high way. school. Yeah, so it, I had to go to London and go to the um, Poetry Society, which is, you know, the Society of Professional Poets and read a poem. It was very, um, it was very intimidating because mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. um, I was just a high school kid and I was reading this poem in front of all of these important people yeah. but uh yeah so i like literature and i liked history but i also like science a lot right. i liked astronomy in particular um and physics and chemistry and i i made the decision to go into science because partly partly for a practical reason i just thought it was more likely that there would be a job <laughs> available mm -hmm. than, than the uncertainty of the arts it just seemed mm -hmm. like it was more of a potentially difficult trajectory to go into the arts and humanities mm -hmm. but I was I was also very strongly um, interested in science perhaps mm -hmm. more interested um, 
And so my first, my undergraduate degree was in physics um, with, with astrophysics. So a lot, I did a lot of astrophysics, but it was while I was uh, doing astronomy that I got interested in planetary science. In the traditional um, astronomy that was done for astronomy degrees or people doing physics and astronomy, there would not actually be much planetary science. Mm -hmm. There might be one course about the solar system or something, and but most of it was cosmology, stars, mm. galaxies, and so on. And that on. was at Oxford, right? No, the, my undergraduate degree was at a, a different university, University of Birmingham. Birmingham. Um, mm -hmm. That's the second biggest city mm -hmm. in, in Britain. But it had a very strong astrophysics uh, course you could do. Um, and actually, it was a project there um, I did, which got me interested in planetary science. science. Mm -hmm. So we had to use a telescope at the university, which, well, actually, it wasn't at the university. It was in the countryside, where it's darker. The skies were darker. Mm -hmm. um, and we had to come up with something. Uh, the telescope was equipped with a um, a charge, what's called a charge couple device, uh, which basically measures the photons. But we also had a right. rating, which made a spectrum of light. I mean, it was in the visible and a little bit in the near infrared. But so we had to use this system and decide what are we going to look at? So, so a lot of people looked at stars because that's mostly what we studied, like maybe binary stars or something. Mm -hmm. And um, I decided, no, I'm going to I'm going to do a planet and uh, maybe the maybe the biggest planet. Let's do Jupiter. It's Jupiter. easy to find because you can see it in the sky, yeah. you know, with your naked eye. So me and two of my uh, fellow students, we had to work in a group. We we looked at the J Jupiter's atmosphere, and uh, with this with the spectrometer, we could see the absorption lines of methane, the molecule CH four, which has some absorption in the mm -hmm. visible and near infrared, and we could actually measure the amount of methane above the cloud top. So the the light from the sun comes in, it bounces off the top of the clouds and goes back, so it passes through the atmosphere twice mm -hmm. uh, we figured out how much methane was in the atmosphere which i thought was pretty cool for i don't know i think i was 18 or 19 maybe mm, that's uh, very impressive yeah i mean it was not new because there'd already been spacecraft that had yeah. gone past jupiter so we we knew how much methane was there but the fact that we could do something as an 18 or 19 year old and measure mm. something we can see in the sky with an Earth-based, like, simple, you know. Yeah, and the telescope like, was about 14 inches reflecting. Oh, really? That's pretty good, actually. Telescope. Well, it's fairly a fairly decent size, but it's not yeah. massive. So we yeah. could do this. I mean, people could probably, if they spent some money, could even afford to buy something yeah. this size, perhaps, Yeah. Uh, in their homes. So, and, we, you know, you can measure something about Jupiter, about its atmosphere. So that was really cool. And then that's... At the same time, um, people were coming aware, I was becoming aware about problems with the Earth's atmosphere, the contemporary climate change problem, also the ozone mm -hmm. layer, the ozone hole. So I got interested in uh, problems of the contemporary atmosphere and how humans are changing the atmosphere. But, you know, our reference point is always what was the atmosphere like in the past before right. humans started to change the atmosphere. So that also got me interested again in the past atmosphere, even before I um, had done a PhD or a postdoc. It was in right. it was in my consciousness and in some of my reading. Uh, and so I, th there were not too many places that did planetary science, but um, Oxford was one of them. So I went there, got accepted to do a, uh, a doctorate there mm -hmm. worked on uh, a project which was about the atmosphere of Mars and how to measure it and how to understand it. So that's what I did. And then in those days, um, you know, it, people didn't travel as much. I don't think students didn't travel as much uh, as they do now. I have a lot of students that go around the yeah. world conferences and so on you do because yeah. i know you went to bulgaria recently 
But in those days, it was like a privilege if you had one international conference during the whole of your PhD, yeah. right? It's considered to be a real privilege. So I didn't know that too many people in the United States, but I corresponded with them by email. And um, and there was one person I wrote to at, at uh, NASA. Uh, at Ames, Chris? Ames Research Center. No, it's actually an older guy called Al Seif. Um, and he'd worked on lots of NASA missions. Um, and, you know, he was getting older and maybe heading heading towards retirement after a few more projects. So he didn't want yeah. to take on someone new, but he passed my material on to um, one of his colleagues. Uh, and then I got invited to go to NASA to give a seminar. So that was pretty cool. Yeah. And um, and then they said, okay, come over and you know, you've know you got some things to offer and um, you can work with us. And, and then I stayed there six years, initially a postdoc and then working as a researcher. Um, but, you know, the problem in that area of California is it's very expensive. So right. I actually realized I've got to get out of Silicon, the Silicon Valley area, oh, yeah. where the price of houses are extreme and also the price of rent is extreme. So, um, so one day I got invited up to Seattle. Mm -hmm. I said, Oh, you know, we've got this new astrobiology seminar program. Come and talk about astrobiology. So I did. And then they said, Oh, we're also going to be um hiring two people, be. two people soon. So why don't you apply for and this is a tenure track permanent job? So then I applied and then I got the job and then I moved. And that's that's basically oh. that's basically my trajectory. Um, and you're still working on methane time to time which is I quite, I mean, quite so impressive it, isn't it it's quite funny that i worked on it when i was maybe 18 or 19 methane right. in planetary atmospheres there and you I'm go. Still working on it. but that's an important molecule for a variety of reasons which we can right. discuss yeah. yeah i i also started to get interested in physics through astronomy and optics like yeah. it's very similar like not i mean i didn't do like you know, the spectro spectroscopic analysis of planets and such, but I was interested in poetry and mm -hmm. I used to just memorize poems, mostly from like in, 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 in Farsi, like Persian language, like oh. from Firdosi or like Hayam yeah. or like Hafiz. And is, um, is hmm? Farsi, does it have some common words with Turkish? Well, there are a lot of words, especially like the religious liturgy is coming from Farsi instead of Arabic. Um, like we basically learned the religion, like Islam, from Iran instead of from, you know, Egypt or Arabs. <clears throat> yeah. So like a lot of language, like like the words, like prophet or like like the prayers, they are all in Persian, but you know the language is very different that we, we don't really understand but there are like words um you can just understand um yeah i was just like memorizing they're like the most of the poems still in my memory are from those times and and i want to make a telescope of my own which which failed i just have a i just had a design that you know right on, a, on, on like a, a software but then i i bought a telescope i think it was six inches Okay. Um, which is pretty, you know, small, but it's a good house size. Was it a reflector or a refractor? <laughs> it, it was it was both. Like it's oh. it's this Schmidt Cassegrain. It's a mirror okay. um geometry. There's like a Schmidt mirror and a correcting plate. Right. Um, so it's like to first order it doesn't have sp spherical aberrations, which is which is pretty good. A bit like that small compact design. And so where you, this was in Turkey, and yeah. where you, there was a good sky, it was dark. Yeah, I mean, I, I I used to go to my grandfather's like garden, which is pretty outside of Turkey, especially at that time, um, it was pretty dark. And and also the, the observatory uh, uh, in Ankara was very near us. So it was especially like dark. 
-hmm. So they chose it because of that too. And like, I could just see like the Milky Way with my naked eye yeah. in, that, in that place. And even like some, I mean, in a very, very good night, I could see Andromeda Galaxy, like just naked right. eye. It's like a faint, like the faintest like cloud. It's like a little, I don't know, smudge. Yeah. 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 I mean, I could see that growing up. I grew up in the countryside yeah. of England and I could see the Milky Way. And yeah. Like I remember like just pushing my eyeball like <laughs> up and down to just get a clearer view. Because like with your if you directly look at it, you can't see it because of the contrast. But if you look at like the periphery of it, you can sometimes see it. Anyhow, but I, I wasn't like, I didn't do like spectroscopy. I'm like, I was just like interested in seeing the deep, deep sky objects, mm. um, like nebulae and like planetary, like nebulae, those type of stuff. And, and I just, would just draw them. And just thinking about how big the universe is. That's always yeah, yeah pretty it. much like that. And then, then I did something like, I mean, I didn't do much astronomy afterwards, like camera. Right. But that that's that's also what got it, got me into science. Um, yeah. Anyhow, so yeah, um, I, mean, I would also I would also say that you know there's there's usually like a few people who are influential teachers, and yeah. that's the same for me. So when I was in high school, I had a very good physics teacher, a very good chemistry teacher. Yeah. Um, biology not so good <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe i mean okay but but um, yeah. maybe maybe not as um the same and then when i was at university as an undergraduate the guy the, the person who supervised the telescope project mm -hmm. was very influential because um basically they spent a lot of time preparing this telescope and putting it together and putting together this system to be used by undergraduates and you know so that that was a big influence that um and also the the guy who put this together was very enthusiastic um and and i got a grade a for my jupiter project so uh -huh. uh, that that worked well um that's a pretty pretty good project honestly it sounds like it sounds easy and like it also is not easy in the in the concept right like it's easy that you can do it at yeah. your home but it's like if you just think about it, it's not easy at all. Well, no, the I mean most of the hard work was done by the the faculty member, right? Who yeah. Put the system together and the the grating spectrometer and the CCD, which also had to be cooled, by the way. Oh. So it, it was. Oh, um, was that in like <clears throat> IR or something? No, but I think you know that I think uh, more modern CCDs are able to operate at a warmer temperature, but back then. They had to be cooled and and a little bit and so there was a cooling system oh, i can't remember the details okay. but it was that. it was a complicated you know it was reasonably technically complicated but most of that hard well basically all of that hard work was done by the faculty I member, which i see was required a big commitment from that that professor right mm -hmm. um, but that makes a difference because then that altered my well it changed what i could do and it, it, right. it inspired things that I've done in my career so these you know these individuals that you have these teachers are very make, influential they make a big difference yeah at certain points yeah that's that's really amazing story and so you after your your PhD in planetary science which I assume after your physics degree you had to learn like a good deal of actual planetary science um, um you went right yeah, I had to learn. So I, I, you know, I specialized in atmospheres. So I had to learn right. a lot of atmospheric science. Um, yeah. A lot of that's physics, but there's also chemistry. Um, and I also had to learn about the ocean because that we actually had a course called the Physics of Atmospheres and Oceans as as a graduate student that mm -hmm. that was long. I think it was spread over a year. Um, lots of homeworks, but you know that it was I, if you have a physics background i think it gives you good confidence to go and learn everything new thing yeah everything um but that's you know, what i always say it's the arrogance but it, it, yeah it that's what i was going to say is that some people become arrogant some physicists yeah. with that knowledge 
and they they start speaking about things they don't know about. So we see right. some some physicists talk about right. climate change, they're climate change deniers even, and that's because they're very arrogant and think they can understand things without reading the literature. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I mean you still have to be humble. Um, right. But yeah, so I I learned that. But I, you know, much of what I learned actually about the geosciences um, is from research. So when I was a postdoc yeah. onwards, I had been learning geosciences continuously, geology, geophysics, mm -hmm. geochemistry. And of course, a lot of what I do now is not physics. It's, it's actually geochemistry, mm -hmm. um, I would say. So sometimes I describe myself. It depends who I'm talking to. If I'm talking to a geologist, I'll say, oh, well, I'm a geochemist. Yeah. If I'm talking to an atmospheric scientist, I would say I stu study planetary atmospheres. Mm -hmm. um, if I'm speaking to a chemist who does origin of life, organic chemistry, I'll say, well, I do. I, I study atmospheric evolution and atmospheric chemistry. Yeah. So, so I often describe myself how I most easily relate to somebody else's mm -hmm. science. But um, basically, I'm all of those things. If you look at my publication record, it's perhaps a little too spread out in some ways mm -hmm. because I've done research on various things. But mm -hmm. it's also, I don't know, it's, it's sometimes a good idea to learn about a lot of different areas and try and contribute in different areas. Right. It, it keeps life interesting. Right. Uh, but it's also good to have one I'm particular yeah. small area that you own. Yeah, yeah. I mean, especially in this field of origin of life, it's inevitable that you can't be the expert of everything you're working on. And um, you you will have an expertise, of course, that you rely on. And that's why people hire you. But you have to read and learn a lot of different things, which are beyond our comfort zone, I would say. It's a lot of like, and like it, it takes a lot of energy for me to just study chemistry and i i don't feel comfortable but i have to at least to communicate my work yeah i think the the subject of the origin of life is perhaps more dis interdisciplinary than any other subject that i deal with really because I, yeah um, you know you first of all you have to start with a habitable planet and that's right. that's the domain of astronomy and astrochemistry and then right. Then there's the environment, that's the domain of atmospheric science, mm -hmm. atmospheric chemistry, geophysics, geology, mm -hmm. um, geochemistry. And then there's the, the formation of life, which is organic chemistry. synthesis. Yeah. Which is a, it's a very separate field, really, from yeah. all of the others that I've talked about. Then there are some other aspects once you get further along in the origin of life it becomes more biochemistry mm -hmm. which is a different subject again and and very specialized with what's happening with genetic molecules rna right or the lipids the membranes chemistry yeah. which even itself is a separate area they have their own there there are separate journals about you know lipids and membranes yeah. so that's a specialist area so i find it yeah it's it's very difficult because nobody has all of this knowledge yeah all these areas mm -hmm. even though i consider myself fairly interdisciplinary once you get to the organic chemistry that's such a specialized topic uh, or subtopics that um i have to rely on colleagues to explain it <laughs> yeah yeah that, that i hear and um okay so let's go to Ames so after you get your PhD you go to Ames in Silicon Valley right that's right yeah. now it's in Silicon Valley like it's a it's an institute by NASA and uh and you were specialized in the Mars missions were you um and how were they like what what did yeah. you do and like what did we learn from the Mars expeditions in in terms of habitability, in terms of how it relates to origin of life, just briefly. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I mean, when I was a postdoc, I was I was mainly working on basic research, so I wasn't mm -hmm. too deeply involved in okay. that point in uh, <clears throat> the actual space projects. Although the people around me yeah. were more involved, um, but what happened was in the nineteen seventies, NASA sent probes to Mars, the Viking missions. Uh, there were two. And each mission consisted of an orbiter mm -hmm. and a lander. So mm -hmm. there are two Viking landers, two Viking orbiters. Mm -hmm. And those, um, the landers were designed to look for life on Mars. But the results were, uh, I don't know, you could call them negative or ambiguous, mm -hmm. but, but generally interpreted as negative, that they didn't find life. Mm -hmm. And um, that had an effect on NASA's Mars program which was basically nothing happened for about, I don't know, a decade or more. So mm -hmm. the 1980s, nothing much happened for NASA's Mars exploration. Mm -hmm. And then in the 1990s, it started up again. And uh, one of the missions was a Mars Pathfinder, but that was just a, you know, a robotic um, engineering demonstration that, that NASA could go back to Mars with with uh, missions to the surface. And then there were some problems with the uh, Mars missions that, that happened around the time I was a postdoc. So um, there was the Mars, there was an orbiter, which was meant to look at the Mars climate, but that um, famously uh, went off course because there was a conversion problem between Imperial units and metric units. Really? Um, yeah, in in uh, in the way that it it's uh, in the way that its trajectory was I going. I can't believe that. Yeah, well, it's yeah, but it happened, and it was it, what <laughs> happened was there was um, somebody in one of the contractors, Lockheed Martin, a young person in their twenties, wrote a program, and they got the units mixed up, and and this kind of fed in, and nobody noticed that this was feeding into the system and giving incorrect information oh my goodness so yeah. so yeah so that was one problem and then there's another problem with another mission um which is called mars polar lander i was actually somewhat involved in that mission it also had these two probes on the lander that was meant to go independently to the surface of the mars mm, okay they, they were called um penetrators i don't mm -hmm. do you know what the penetrator probe is it's like a it's like a tube with a that digs in and then places like a tube, right? Yeah. So there were two penetrator probes, and there was the main lander, and they were meant mm -hmm. to go to the south pole of Mars. Yeah. But again, it was a software problem, as far as we know, that caused this lander to crash. Okay. So instead of instead of Mars Polar Lander, it became Mars Polar Crasher. Crasher. And what happened was there was some software which was detecting when it landed. So when it landed, there would be a jolt, like, you know, mm -hmm. but instead when it, it above the surface of Mars, it opened up its legs and there was a jolt with that. And it thought, mm. the software thought, oh, it landed. Oh. Yeah. So then it stopped the thruster and then it just, it just like uh, smashed down afterwards. Yeah, it, and so it was just another software problem. Wow. What a bummer. So, so these were two missions that failed um, spectacularly. And uh, while you were there. Yeah, while I was. <laughs> and so at this at this time, you know, that there must was, be it, frustrating to be around those people at the time. Oh, well, so I did waste some time. So with the Mars Polar Lander mission, I probably wasted at least a year of my life, probably, because, um, you know, there's a lot of preparation yeah work you have to do but um but in the end it was turned out to be useful because uh the same the same style of lander but with the software fixed <laughs> was used for another mission called the phoenix mission to mars and i was a science team member for that mission mm -hmm. um so that was later that that arrived at mars in 2008 and mm -hmm. went to the north polar region of mars and it was a successful mission it did everything that it was supposed to do it had a it was a, it was just a fixed lander but it had a robotic arm and it dug 
into the soil and um, revealed ice under the surface. And it also sampled the soil chemistry. Basically, mm -hmm. it took soil, added it to water, and measured what dissolved, so the soluble salts. Like NMR or something? Like what, what was the technique? What, oh, uh, it used iron uh, selective electrodes. Um, oh, okay. So these are these are electrodes that their voltage can change depending on how right. an iron, how an iron right, interacts. Right. Uh, yeah, I built one actually for sulfide to measure sulfide concentrations. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you can. So so it had a bunch of these electrodes, but there are also some reagents that were added. So um, to measure sulfate. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know whether you did this in, in chemistry in high school. I did it in high school, but no. there was a sulfate test. I didn't, you didn't, we were taught in high school where you add barium chloride and then sulfate will precipitate as barium sulfate, which is a white mm -hmm. solid. Uh, and so we did actually did the same thing with these little four of these little um, uh, teacup sized mm -hmm. um vessels on Mars. So we had a sulfate protocol as well as detecting individual soluble ions and then also the pH. Uh, so anyway, that was the first time that, you know, the soluble salts had been measured on Mars because when the Viking landers went to Mars, um, people were so fixated on measuring biology right. that they did not make some simple measurements of the inorganic environment. Mm -hmm. So you, you would think that you would probably measure the soluble soil salts um, yeah. if you're going to Mars and trying to understand whether the biology is there. But they they had these very elaborate instruments to measure metabolism um, if, it, if there was life on Mars. And they didn't make some of the simpler measurements of just the, the background soil and things so 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 that happened later with the phoenix lander um and then since then you know there have been other well before then there were the mars exploration rovers um 2004 um and then later there's been the curiosity rover 2012 right. and then more recently landing in 2021 there was the perseverance uh rover which is like the curiosity rover the same yeah. size of rover but different instruments um and what what they've broadly speaking what all of these missions have shown is that um today mars is a very dry cold desert mm -hmm. but early in its history liquid water was flowing on mars there was more activity so right. things processes happening uh, on the surface of Mars, that there were things in the soil, such as phosphorus or carbon or sulfur um, and nitrogen, a little bit of nitrogen that, that could have been used by by life so that people right. tend to think that there's the potential for habitability. However, unfortunately, as yet, no definitive sign of life has been detected. Like we mm -hmm. cannot say that any of the instruments so far has found life, but we are we are limited. When when you go right. probe to Mars, you just have these instruments, um, which are they're not as sophisticated as the instruments mm -hmm. you have in a lab on Earth. Right. But what the Perseverance rover is doing is is it collecting samples putting them in tubes and then and just then letting them sit there, letting them sit there. So they'd be collected in the future like the, yeah. brought back to earth. And then here on earth, they can be analyzed with the most sophisticated, most expensive, biggest elaborate right. instruments available. So this is the build up to what is called Mars sample return. All right. And then we'll see whether there are signs of life in in these samples that get returned, but that's in the future. So right. the next, maybe the next decade, not this one, but um, the next one, there'll be researchers looking at these samples in, in labs around right. the world. I think the, the, the first one of the tube, uh, tubes 
were dropped like two weeks ago or something, right? Yeah, just recently the first depot was yeah. was done. Yeah, but there will be more. Um, so, so yeah, it'll it'll be interesting to see. Of course, we already have samples from Mars. Yeah, those are the Mars meteorites. Um, but these are like lacustrine sediments, right? Yeah, the diff the difference is that the samples being collected are from a place where you know there's there's independent evidence for liquid water in the past yeah. whereas the samples that are just in the meteorites most of those are just volcanic well they're just basically volcanic rock samples um there yeah. may be some traces of uh, mm -hmm. salts or other types of things but they're basically volcanic rocks right right like it's it's interesting that like like the phoenix mission and the ones like the two of them before were specifically targeted for looking for life on Mars instead of just trying to understand the, the Mars as a planet, right? So they were astrobiology missions or they were... Well, both... the, 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 the Viking mission in the 1970s was an astrobiology mission. Right. But um, the more recent landers have just been looking at whether Mars is habitable. They, they, right. they haven't really had the kind of uh, um, instruments to detect the organic molecules of life per se. I mean, right. a little bit to some extent. They haven't been focused so much on detecting life as detecting the geochemistry of the environment or the geological right. context and so on. So I wouldn't say they were pure... I wouldn't say they were astrobiology missions. I, only in the sense that they're looking at the habitability yeah. of Mars, but not directly um, looking for life. Life, yeah. Right? Unless, unless it's obvious. So, you know, if if um, a camera found a structure that was biological, or a bug just walking obvious. around. No, I'm thinking more <laughs> of a, a stromatolite, which is right. a microbial a fossil. Mass. Yeah. Also, mm -hmm. microbial mound, um, not something walking around. You know, it's quite, <laughs> quite, quite amusing when you read the literature. If you go back mm -hmm. to, well, it depends how far you want to go back. But if you go back to, um, yeah. then even the nineteen sixties, uh, there are people talking about things walking on yeah. Mars. Even Carl Sagan was talking about, okay, we know Mars is cold. Maybe it has big creatures like polar bears that can withstand the cold. That's a, that's really? a remark he made in the early 1970s, yeah. which today seems quite funny. Right. Um, but what's not so funny is if you go back to the 1950s, it was common to believe that there was vegetation on Mars. It was quite a common um, interpretation in the scientific community. Mm. And you know, Mars has these dust storms that make Dune, Mars... Yeah that change color mm -hmm. in a telescope. So it becomes darker or lighter. Um, oh. People thought that that was actually a wave of vegetation, uh, oh. even in the 1950s. So I have a, I think I have a copy of this thing called the NASA Mars Manual from the 1950s, which is a compendium of everything we oh, knew yeah. about Mars at that time. And, and there's a big section on, you know, it's generally, and it says something like, it's generally thought that the wave of darkening is because of the spread of vegetation. vegetation. Yeah, and uh, and you're oh. thinking, people really believe that? And, well, they did. Um, not everybody. There were occasionally people who said that they thought it was something else. Like, like uh, there was a guy from the University of Michigan whose name escapes me now, but he argued it was dust. He was correct. But... Um, people didn't like his idea you know yeah so because because they wanted to believe that it was vegetation and he got a lot of um i don't know criticism criticism yeah i was going to say uh criticism is the right word i was going to say appropriate, but that's too strong yeah. <laughs> not appropriate criticism um so he actually you know, he worked mainly on astronomy because the, it was what he believed about Mars was too controversial. So he stepped wow. away. It's so bizarre. Like right now, if you find 
the most like controversial like thing about a planet that is indicating life that becomes a big deal right like i don't know like a, a, an oddly shaped rock or phosphine gas on like venus and at that time just like like trees were just common knowledge about mars right <laughs> it's kind no, of bizarre like trees, but 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 simple vegetation. Like vegetation yeah 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 so um but like i said not everybody yeah bought into that but the majority of scientists if you read the literature at that yeah. time that was the majority uh, point of view um yeah some people were highly skeptical but they were a minority they turned out to be right mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, part, part of um the problem was that you know everybody was speculating even the people who thought that it wasn't vegetation some of those thought that okay maybe it's volcanic clouds maybe there are these volcanoes on mars and they're making lots of dusty clouds yeah That's, uh, turned out not to be right but the idea of dust is correct it's correct yeah so everybody was getting something wrong and 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 the problem is just when you have a lack of data um and it, it, yeah. leaves, it leaves room for, for speculation of speculation yeah. yeah yeah that's very true i brought a piece of stromatolite this oh. is actually you know just to show people that this is a possibility that yeah. one can see in mars that would be a big deal it, you can see that like microbial mat growing it's it's so from where? morocco it's it's right. about two billion years old okay just quite impressive i mean still like this is something i bought for very cheap but like ah uh, you went to the atlas mountain area of morocco and they they did you buy trilobites they sell lots of trilobites i i i have trilobites not here though yeah um, yeah okay because i know the atlas mountains of morocco are famous for their trilobites trilobites yeah there's lots of people there uh, collect and sell trilobites to tourists but you mm -hmm. have to be careful because sometimes they, I mean, a lot of them are real, but sometimes they fake them to make them yeah. more, to make them nicer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So just like going back to the topic, um, if we can summarize why Mars is interesting, it's, we can kind of think of it as like a, like a Hadean earth frozen in time, more or less, right? Because it, it stopped. Uh, being active like volcanically and uh, it, it like its dynamo got lost we don't really know why and it, it preserves some of the conditions that we think is similar to the early earth before or around the time that life started and that's why mars is interesting is that correct statement um yes broadly speaking i mean so so we know that some of the surfaces of Mars are very old because they mm -hmm. retain impact mm -hmm. craters like the moon's yeah. surface. And we also know they're old from the Martian meteorites. So some of those yeah. Martian meteorites are quite old rocks. Old rocks of that age, like older than 4 billion or older even than 3.5 billion, are very rare yeah. on the Earth. So yeah, Mars perhaps has a record yeah of an early planet where there was water where there were rocks which were not too dissimilar to those on the earth mm -hmm. and maybe it preserves some simple life or even preserves a record of prebiotic synthesis if, if it didn't get as far as yeah. as life mm -hmm. um, and then there's also the possibility that maybe it never had life in which case why not yeah it, had the right kind of geochemistry it had water yeah. it had the right elements so it's still interesting whether it had life or not of course it's more interesting if it had an independent origin of life origin of life yeah and if it did not then it's also interesting to ask like why it did not happen there like what right. conditions were not present that were on earth um, well mars, mars is a different planet i mean for yeah. a start it's about half the diameter of the earth yeah. it's about one ninth the mass so yes. mm -hmm. one of the reasons that the volcanoes are extinct today is that it just cooled more quickly because it's a smaller higher surface area yeah volume, um, right? 
Yeah, there may also be geochemical reasons. Mm -hmm. um, but basically, the, the volcanoes are extinct now, more or less. I mean, maybe there's once every 50 million years, maybe mm -hmm. something happens, but it's um, it's dormant. Yeah. Uh, also, being a smaller planet, it doesn't have as much gravity, so the atmosphere is more easily lost. Lost. Mm -hmm. On the Earth, it escapes into space. Mm. Um, so that's those are two big reasons how... Mars has had a different evolution than yeah. These are very important. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and also it's farther from the sun, so right. the distance is about on average one point five yeah. times more distant, so it's right. colder. So the yeah. factors, colder, smaller, um, basically, as as uh, mm -hmm. I guess, there's like a bigger, greater. bigger problem of faint young sun, right? <laughs> Yes, so the the sun was probably thirty percent less luminous four billion years ago than today, and so it's even colder at the orbit of Mars then than now. Yeah. So you need to have a thicker atmosphere. You Thick basically atmosphere. need to have a greenhouse effect of about mm -hmm. 80, 80 degrees Celsius. Yeah. Today, the greenhouse effect of the Earth is about thirty three, thirty four degrees Celsius. So that gives you a sense mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah okay so since you brought the topic to greenhouse gases i i want to switch gears to quickly to atmospheres okay and um you actually have another book i do and that's that's about I have, that one. I have that one next to me too uh-huh <laughs> here it is but i have to put it on my chest because the camera right atmospheric evolution uh and now it does it backwards, but it says atmospheric evolution on in inhabited and lifeless worlds. No. But right. this is a very this is a very technical book. This is for this is for science, like this, this is, is for, for other experts. scientists, other yeah. scientists or people like you who are studying for a PhD. It's not it's not for the general public. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there are hundreds of equations in here, right. so it's quite <laughs> it assumes a knowledge of. Uh, differential calculus and physics and chemistry yeah mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so I, I i would like to ask you in in light of that research that you have done and still been doing like why studying the atmospheres of planets important in terms of origin of life and um and then i will ask some questions about titan and okay. your work with chris mckay Okay, well, so um, if you think about planetary bodies, the atmosphere enables life and it yeah. enables the environment for life. Mm -hmm. So if we think about the Earth, the Earth would be an unpleasant place without the Earth's atmosphere. The, the atmosphere warms the, the planet on average about... 33 degrees 34 degrees celsius in the present mm -hmm. and it's always had um a substantial greenhouse effect mm -hmm. uh, because if you go back in time it needed an even bigger greenhouse effect as we were just discussing yeah. because the sun was fainter, fainter. Mm -hmm. also the atmosphere provides um gases that are used by life uh so for example i breathing oxygen right now um mm -hmm. without oxygen i will die and so would you uh but then that comes from the atmosphere but then it's also produced by life area mm -hmm. and, and green yeah. algae and green plants um and then also carbon in the atmosphere in carbon dioxide is used by photosynthesis mm -hmm. uh, as a as a source of carbon to make most of the carbon organic mm -hmm. carbon on the planet mm -hmm. so um so atmospheres are essential for the climate and habitability of planets without an atmosphere you a, a planet often has extremes of temperature like for example well think think of moons like our moon it has a day side that's that's warm and then a, a night side that is extremely cold um, but the atmosphere can spread the heat around a planet 
It can also main, basically maintain the surface temperature suitable for liquid water. So that is the conventional uh, definition of habitability. Yeah. Uh, it's an atmosphere that mm -hmm. has a big enough greenhouse effect that it maintains a surface for, for liquid water. And also the planet is in the right place in a solar system. Um, for the origin of life, uh, the atmosphere can can provide essential molecules that are used in the synthesis of the first biomolecules. Mm -hmm. And um, some of those uh, molecules, such as nitriles, so these are molecules that have carbon triply bonded to a nitrogen. The simplest one is HCN, hydrogen cyanide. Mm -hmm. Those molecules are essential in... Um, Organic. the, scheme, the mm -hmm. schemes of prebiotic synthesis which we know work because they've been demonstrated in the lab uh to make the genetic molecules so the the nuclear bases in particular mm -hmm. and if we have life we have to have life that has a genome right. i don't think you can have something we call life without a genome it doesn't make any yeah. sense um, yeah so, I will come to that part actually. That's yeah, we that's can a very interesting it. discussion that you also made in Bulgaria. Um, yeah, it's important to to have an understanding of what we mean by life. Yeah, uh, I can talk about the definition of life, but but that involves a genome, and and to make a genome, yeah, the molecules of the genome, you start with these simple molecules. One of them is hydrogen cyanide, and that the only abundant. Um, form of hydrogen cyanide that's known is in planetary atmospheres in the gas okay. form yeah and and, and specific types mm -hmm. of planetary mm -hmm. atmospheres mm -hmm. so and then atmospheres also change over time so they they start if you if you form a planet um you'll have a particular type of atmosphere maybe some has been accreted from yeah solar nebula so uh but then that can be lost and then you can have an atmosphere that's replenished by volcanoes and so on, or you can lose an atmosphere by escape to space. So that's the subject of atmospheric evolution. If we want to understand the origin of life, habitable planets, and whether life persists, yeah. that's all the subject of the origin and evolution of planetary atmospheres. And that's why I wrote, partly why I wrote that book about atmospheric evolution, evolution. Yeah, is that... My co-author and I, my co-author was Jim Casting, Casting. who's a mm -hmm. professor at um, uh, Penn State University. We, you know, we had a lot of knowledge that we'd accumulated, but it was all spread around in different yeah. papers and different journals, different yeah. books. So we wanted to sit down and put that all into one book um, that people could refer to. Um, yeah. You know, the, the problem with writing books that are, at that level is that as soon as it's published it's outdated outdated because people publish new things so we were in some chapters of that book we're careful to kind of write down the principles things yeah. that would not change yeah and, and you know we had a full list of references the book has over two thousand citations um really wow yeah so we wanted to summarize the literature up until 2017 when the book was published so it's still useful to see, you know, the history of what people think. Yeah. And, um, and you know, there, there are these ideas that that maybe are published 30 years ago that that nobody nobody notices, and then they and then they they come up again. Somebody rediscovers something that somebody thought about yeah. decades ago. Um it's surprising how that happens. So it's still it's still as useful to know the history of the subject and how people's think thoughts evolve because sometimes you go back to an older idea that that turns out to be correct yeah 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 especially like in subjects like this that you know that we don't know much about it like some of the speculations are like irrespective of when they were made in time are right. as equally likely to be right as they were as the ones that were made really recently yeah. Um, so I was gonna say, like about atmospheres. Um, I mean, it's no brainer that you know you for life you need things, and they either come from down or they come from up. And 
and right. life itself you know changes these things like changes the surface changes the atmospheres so you have to study um the um the atmospheres of planets and also i i guess it's safe to say that they are easier to study like if if i look at an exoplanet right i cannot see its surface but i can do something about its atmospheric compositions like like you like your high school project with more sophisticated Un under instruments. undergraduate project it is i yeah. wasn't quite, I sorry wasn't quite yeah undergraduate. yeah <laughs> i mean yeah. basically what james webb is doing right now is what right. he did with jupiter by looking at a farther objects with more complicated instruments right yeah, it's similar. It's it's basically it's a different. I was looking at reflectance spectroscopy. James mm -hmm. Webb will do transmission, mm -hmm. so it's slightly different, but but the same idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to ask you about uh, your work with Chris McKay and 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 the and the findings um, in Titan about um, were they methano methanogenic bacteria speculations or the the bacteria as like a, a hydrogen sink there was that discussion that i made with um i i, I had an interview with uh the famous turkish scientist his name is jalal and and he's he's kind of um a character and he he's he's not doing like geobiology he's more like a tectonic structural uh -huh. geology person but he's apparently friends with chris uh -huh. and and he said that like he believes for sure that there's life on Titan. And Chris even said to him that. And I was quite skeptical about it when he said that. Um, but he he has that like like Oxfordian attitude, like <laughs> like <laughs> loud, like loud and like posh. Um right. he he actually didn't go to Oxford, but he has that attitude for some reason. Um but he said, yeah, there's like for sure life on Earth, you know. I, I believe it. And uh, I, I want you to comment on it because especially you work with Chris and what, what did you think about it? And just give, give us like a brief one minute summary of what the finding was about the, you know, the the so, finding of the hydrogen thing. So this is not, I should just clarify. It's, I, I did work with Chris McKay when I was mm -hmm. um, at NASA Ames. Yeah. But I worked, I worked with Chris mainly on projects about the ancient earth mm -hmm. and mars and i didn't i didn't really work with him on titan although he does a lot of work yeah about titan and so later he published a paper i wasn't part of the paper uh arguing that there could be life on titan and the argument was based on the idea that um when you look near the surface of the planet um there's perhaps a deficit of hydrogen yeah uh, and the idea is that life could be using the hydrogen combining it with acetylene so that's the molecule c2h2 mm -hmm. and making methane methane yeah basically um so that is a potential metabolism that mm -hmm. produces energy mm -hmm. but um I don't know. I consider the idea quite quite speculative, and I suspect that you know there may be other explanations uh, right. as to why. That maybe there's some kind of abiotic reaction that that does the same thing, or there's some catalyst that mm -hmm. enables that. Um, but I, I have I, in general, I have problems with life on Titan. I'm not, um, at least at the surface, um, I'm not a great proponent of that idea for, for for one basic reason but um it relates to the fact that the surface is extremely cold mm -hmm. so the surface temperature at, in the equator of titan is about 94 kelvin that's measured wow right the temperature at the poles is not much different it's actually about 91 kelvin mm. And the reason there's not much gradient is because it has a thick atmosphere and it does what I described earlier, it distributes mm -hmm. the heat. Greenhouse so, gases. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um so basically, basically, when you're that cold, the only liquids you have are 
nitrogen. Liquid, no, not it's not cold enough for liquid nitrogen. A liquid methane or liquid ethane, mm. so C2H6, that's ethane, it's the next alkane in the series mm -hmm. after, after methane. Um, but we know from the petroleum industry that those liquids at those temperatures are actually quite poor solvents. I so see. You, cannot, you cannot dissolve big molecules mm. at those temperatures with those solvents. So people speculate about what they call what they call weird life. Weird life, meaning life which is not in liquid water, but another solvent. And on Titan, that solvent would be liquid methane or a mixture with liquid ethane and methane or maybe liquid ethane it, itself. Mm. And I don't think that can work. And the reason is the solubility problem that you will not dissolve big molecules. Now, this gets us back to the question of what is life? Right. Because I define life as follows, a genome containing self-sustaining entity that has evolved. Mm -hmm. Okay. And in my definition, what life do you mean by evolved? evolved? Is it Darwinian evolution or is not necessary? Darwin. No, evolved by by natural selection. So Darwinian the Darwinian evolution. evolution. Okay. Yeah. Um, you can say that it has evolved by Darwinian mm -hmm. means or by natural selection, whatever. Because uh, I think it makes a difference. Like stars are evolving, but it's well, not okay. But I mean, I mean, evolved in the biological sense or okay. basically, yeah, natural selection. Okay. Um. But essential to that definition is having a genome, because I think yeah. if you don't have a recipe for self-reproduction yeah. um, and function, how can you possibly call that alive yeah. if, if something doesn't have that? I mean, for example, my, a car metabolizes, but it's not alive. Everybody knows it's not alive because it doesn't have a genome. It doesn't self-reproduce. Yeah with a with a recipe encoded in a genome so i think even the simplest form of life if we're to call it life it needs to have some genome mm -hmm. and i don't think weird life on titan can have a big enough molecule dissolved in these solvents to be alive mm -hmm. it just doesn't work it's it's not it's it's a physics it's a physical chemistry problem um yeah. that these these solvents are very poor solvents right. at, at these temperatures. So, you know, in my in my book, the technical one, I actually have a little discussion of that, which um, came about from a discussion with uh, another scientist, Chris Christopher Glein, who has published papers on Titan, mm -hmm. um, and he's he's referenced. You know, I'd have a footnote saying this this little discussion came from talking to Christopher Glein. Mm -hmm. Chris Klein was actually an undergraduate student with me. He's, he was a chemistry major at the University of Washington. Mm -hmm. uh, and then since then, he's got a PhD elsewhere. And he now works on outer planets and um, has worked on the Cassini mission and published papers. But um, he also knows a lot of chemistry. And so we were saying, well, you know, why doesn't this is not going to work. Yeah. So I think if there is on life on Titan, it has to be deeper in the subsurface where liquid water exists. Water, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think, but but Titan, by the way, is an extremely interesting for origin of life chemistry because it has this chemistry where there are nitriles in the atmosphere, there's oh. large particles being made, there's exotic chemistry going on. You know, it's a... Uh, it's our example of what happens when you have a, an atmosphere with nitrogen and methane in it and what you get, you know, as a result of atmospheric chemistry, you, you make HCN, you make benzene molecules, um, you make various nitriles. So, so the, you know, going to Titan and measuring the organic chemistry is, is very interesting, interesting. Yeah. or organic synthesis. That's different from saying there's weird life on Titan, right? Which is a much more speculative mm -hmm. statement. 
Mm -hmm. There could be life in the subsurface where if you go deep enough, there's um, a subsurface ocean. It's thought on time. Right. That, that would be life like us that uses liquid water as a solvent. It would be like terrestrial I life. See. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. You know, it'd have, have similar chemistry, so it wouldn't be completely strange. Right. Um, so anyway, I'm a skeptic about the so-called weird life in in Titan's lakes. Um, but they measured the the decrease in the hydrogen mixing ratio as you go down, and that's an authentic measurement. Is that correct? So they had uh, there was a Titan Huygens probe. Mm -hmm. So this was part of the Cassini mission. Mm -hmm. Cassini is an orbiter around Saturn, but the European Space Agency made a probe. Uh, NASA was also a collaborator, and the probe fell through the atmosphere of Titan. It had a parachute, and it went all the way to the surface, and it made measurements all the way mm -hmm. to the surface. So, so those measurements, you know, made with a mass spectrometer, those are good measurements. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so... I see, I see. So that's interesting, though. So what you're saying is the the atmosphere of titan is what kind of we want for you know creating simple building blocks of life so therefore the the chemistry in the atmosphere is interesting however because there's no water on the surface it's unclear how the um the chemistry like where the chemistry would take place right well so i mean there are also impacts on Titan. Mm -hmm. um, Titan's so cold that, you know, water is frozen. Yeah. Carbon dioxide is frozen. So, so one of the other problems with Titan is the lack of um, oxygen or sulfur chemistry. So most of the yeah. chemistry is carbon and hydrogen and nitrogen. Mm -hmm. Chemistry that we have is carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen plus oxygen right plus sulfur, sulfur and and plus phosphorus yeah maybe so, iron too yeah yeah but that the the so-called sponge elements s p o n c h they make up you know 99 percent of the element composition mm -hmm. so so those are the really important ones and on titan there's a problem because um the oxygen containing molecules water carbon dioxide those are solids because it's so cold uh, the there's a little bit of um oxygen containing molecules that fall into the atmosphere of titan from mm -hmm. uh material that's ejected from enceladus which is another moon of saturn that goes into the orbit around saturn it makes the e-ring of saturn it comes from jets which are coming out of the south pole of enceladus um, and those are mainly water ice uh, particles and and some of those molecules end up coming to titan as extraterrestrial mm -hmm. infall but that's very very small so mm -hmm. so another problem with titan life is just the the range of molecules the, the the molecules are interesting for prebiotic chemistry but the range is different because they don't have the oxygen phosphorus and sulfur that we have on the earth because of the geology and the atmosphere yeah. that we have here on earth and the temperature regime water is is a, a liquid water is a vapor co2 is a gas but co2 can dissolve in water phosphorus comes out of rocks it's yeah. leached out of rocks and it's critical for our energy molecule adenosine, adenosine triphosphate is critical for our genetic molecules right. the phosphate backbone of dna and um you know, it's also in RNA. So um, that's that the, there are profound differences in the chemistry between right. the hydrocarbon world and the liquid water world that we live on. I see. I see. That's 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 amazing because like the differences are really important to um, to distinguish what kind of chemistry would take place. And I want to bring the discussion to the um the last topic so okay. you can talk or as much like. as you want about it which is like the um like how would the transition from geochemistry to biochemistry would take place as you framed it in 
in your talk, which which was really wonderful. And I want you to justify your claim. Okay. Um, about for like the first thing is like I want I want you to talk about the the kind of the reductionist uh, approach. Maybe I can say, which I believe, uh, like you first say like lot you make a definition of life and then reduce that definition to the existence of a genome and then make another assumption and say that genome is rna or rna is needed for a genome and then the rest is not really an assumption but then you say okay then the problem is reduced to the synthesis of ribonucleotides so you start from life and then you reduce the problem to the synthesis of nucleotides so first I want you to justify that. Um, you know, it's it's not certain, and I believe that, but it's important claim. And uh, and the second part is like like you did in your talk. Can you briefly like you know give the important like elements for like making ribonucleotides? Like, what do we need, and why lakes the the superficial lakes uh, are important for the origin of life? Okay, there's a lot of questions there. <laughs> I, I know, I know. You can talk as much as you want. This is my last question. <clears throat> yeah. So, so let's start with with um, if we if if we're dealing with the question of the origin of life. Yeah. We need to understand what life is at some level to yeah. know what we're making. Okay. So we just had a discussion where I said that I think that life is this genome containing entity yeah. that is self-sustaining and has evolved by natural selection. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot wrapped up in that idea that maybe is not obvious. Um, so I just want to mention that first, mm -hmm. which is, um, so I do have metabolism in that definition because I said self-sustaining. Yeah. I also said in a particular environment, so one of the strange things, I think, people take it for granted, but one of the strange things about life is that we are, we have co-evolved with the environment, right? Yeah. You're alive, but if I take you as this alive organism and I transport you to space where there's no oxygen and no atmosphere, you'll, you will very rapidly be dead. You're only right. alive in the context of the environment that, that, you evolved in a sense there's we have our genome but there's also like um the environment is a sort of an extension of mm -hmm. our genome our genome is adapted to the environment we rely on plants and bacteria to provide all of our oxygen and to right. provide all of our food so right. there's we're embedded in an ecology so a particular environment is has to be a part of the definition of life because I don't know of any life that doesn't exist within some context of um, yeah. a very special environment or an ecology of other organisms that, that it relies on, <clears throat> even bacteria that are that that extract their carbon from the atmosphere. They still rely on the environment to provide nutrients and to provide water, liquid water. So they're relying on that. They don't have the means to to get these nutrients they're just supplied by the environment and they're adapted to that so so there is metabolism in life i don't deny that that's the self-sustaining bit and i use the past tense to say has evolved right by natural selection there are these other definitions around which says that life is you know some chemical system capable of darwinian evolution but that that doesn't work for very obvious organisms like sterile um, organisms that are hybrids. They're still alive, but they can't evolve in the future. They're not capable of Darwinian, Darwinian evolution in the future because they can have no reproduction. But what, what is very important for life is all life has this history, history, mm -hmm. a history that goes back and back and back where it has evolved in, yeah. in Darwin's natural selection. And even there's a pre-Darwinian point of prebiotic chemistry where maybe the evolution was chemical evolution. It was just changes in the chemistry that was not, you know, not evolution in the genetic sense, but in some other way. 
but it's still part of that long history mm -hmm. of of life so i think the past tense and talking about history of life is in fact part of the definition of life mm -hmm. like you can't divorce life from its history. history and if you try and do that you end up with a bad definition that doesn't work yeah. <laughs> that you'll find in the literature bad definitions where it's like no hang on a minute this doesn't work <laughs> so this is one of those things that you as a young scientist and other young scientists should always if you read a definition you know is it even if it's supposed to be from important people does it really does it really work and maybe there's something better that you can come up with right yeah. so that's the definition of life and genome is an essential part of life so we need to have a genome now now people also talk about um the chemistry um prebiotic chemistry that that could make metabolism and that's important too but the genome is so essential to the definition that we have to consider chemistry that makes genetic molecules yeah now if we talk about the origin of life our one example of life is earth we have to be able to explain the origin of life on earth before we can fully think about possible origins of life on other planets mm -hmm. okay so that's so we look at life on earth and you know people say life is dna based um we are but actually there's a lot of rna that's doing things in our cells right a messenger rna takes the message from uh the dna to translate it into amino acids right. and proteins um there's all sorts of rnas in 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 the cell and in particular there's the ribosome which is the structure inside cells that makes the proteins so um and this is a catalytic structure so the rna is behaving as a catalyst and when we look at um, enzymes in biology we see that often they have a protein part but they often also have this other part called a cofactor or a coenzyme a non-protein part which is made of something that looks like the molecules of dna or rna there are genetic molecules in there yeah. and and ever since the 1970s that has been interpreted as a remnant of a previous metabolism mm -hmm. that was more based on RNA. Mm -hmm. and then the protein parts were added later or maybe at the same time, but certainly the RNA was, was around. I mean, also look at the energy molecule of life, ATP, adenosine triphosphate. It looks exactly the same as, as, a, as an RNA. It is, RNA, you yeah. would say that it is a ribonucleotide because yeah. it has the letter a the, ad the adenine and it, it, has, it has a five carbon sugar so it makes adenosine and then it has the phosphate yeah. it's exactly the same as a as a ribonucleotide it just happens to have um three phosphates instead of one you know mm -hmm. and it can have one it can be adenosine monophosphate so it's basically a ribonucleotide so our, the the molecule which provides the energy storage for all life is a ribonucleotide mm -hmm. and then ribonucleotides are, have this history in the metabolism they also come before in in our current cells they come before the proteins because they make the proteins it's the ribosome which is chugging away joining together the amino acids to make the proteins so all of these reasons suggest that um uh these these genetic molecules these are ribonucleotides had to be early in the history of life how early we don't know exactly was there were there genetic molecules that came before the ribonucleotides that were slightly different maybe we're not classic ribonucleotides don't know but at some point in the origin of life we have to have these um ribonucleotides to to be to have continuity from there to what we see in modern biochemistry and um and you can have a ribonucleotide which is both the catalyst and a genetic molecule it, it encodes the information for the organism but it also has some catalytic capability 
So in principle, you can have a ribonucleotide that that's self replicates, and and could be that's the hypothesis could be a primitive form of life. Life, mm -hmm. yeah, because it does all of the things that that our definition requires. It has a genome. Yeah. Um, it will be in a suitable environment, and it will it will be doing some kind of primitive metabolism, an RNA, a, a ribonucleotide based right. metabolism. So it's self-sustains. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and also um, is evolving because the, right. the, the sequence can change and it can right. improve by selection. So um, so for all of those reasons, you know, we think that that uh, this kind of RNA, simple, simple RNA-based org organism may have been a stage in the origin of life. There may have been um, amino acids and peptides at the same time that were involved. Uh, so people often talk about an RNA peptide right. world. Mm -hmm. um, they've moved away from, they used to talk about an RNA world. I don't think there yeah. are many people who believe in pure RNA, just doing its own thing in the absence of any amino acids, probably more likely mm -hmm. amino acids and peptides were there and it was an RNA peptide world. Mm -hmm. After all, if you look at the ribosome, what is it? It's RNA and it's proteins. It's kind of somehow evolved probably from an RNA peptide. Right. So now we have to get to RNA, mm -hmm. the or ribonucleotides and the prebiotic synthesis um, pathways have been demonstrated in the lab where you can start with simple molecules like mm -hmm. hydrogen cyanide, water, and you can make ribonucleotides. Or, well, you actually need phosphate as well. Um, because phosphate's part of those molecules. Uh, and to the best of my knowledge, all of the successful syntheses of ribonucleotides have used um, nitriles, hydrogen cyanide, or molecules derived from nitriles. Nitriles. Mm -hmm. um, even when people try to use ammonia as a nitrogen source, they they Usually at some stage, hydrogen cyanide comes in there too. Mm -hmm. So, But certainly the simplest pathways involve the nitriles, and we know that they can make, with good yield, ribonucleotides. So the people mm -hmm. who do this kind of chemistry, you know, the leading researchers, John Sutherland at the University of Cambridge, mm -hmm. uh, so Matt Powner, but there are other groups. There's like Thomas Carell in uh, Germany. Um, there's people at Georgia Tech. Uh, they're basically working with, and there's also Steve Banner, they're, they're all working with this common chemistry that uses nitriles mm -hmm. and phosphate. Um, so where would hydrogen cyanide come from? Where would phosphate come from on the early earth? And how do you get it concentrated enough to drive right. the reactions? So just, just before you go there, like we now reduce the problem of finding a conducive environment to origin of life, to an environment that would contain cyanide. Yes. Right? Okay. And phosphate. And phosphate, right. Okay. Um, because you have to have the phosphate at the end of the molecule. <laughs> right. So, um, so we can so also- cyanide, cyanide is needed to create the, the basic organic structure, like the sugars, like ribose, like sugars, amino acids, which um and also the, the, the primarily the nuclear bases yeah nuclear bases right. right and then phosphates gets attached to them to create the nucleotides yes and and therefore we need both yes and we need an environment to find those two yeah mm -hmm. so now if we go back to basic chemistry in order to get a, a chemical reaction to go forward from left to right mm -hmm. um you want to drive the reaction by having concentrated chemicals on the left-hand side mm -hmm. to make the products. So you need mm -hmm. concentrated reactants. Right. If the reactants are so dilute, maybe they're like, you know, nanomolar in in a solution, mm -hmm. they they the reaction may not go forward. It just it it just won't work. Um, right even if it does work, the yield would be so small, it'd be useless because the molecules would be so uh, so dilute. So um, in these reactions that people do in the lab, they usually have pretty concentrated 
um, reactants. And also sometimes um, the background solution may need like, a, for example, a high level of phosphate um, in order for the chemistry to work. So then you have to ask yourself, okay, where, does, where do the nitriles come from and how do you get them concentrated? Where does the phosphate come from? How do you get it concentrated? Yeah. And um, we know when we look at the solar system that we find hydrogen cyanide in the atmospheres of the giant planets and also Titan. And there it's made, particularly on Titan, where it's quite abundant, mm -hmm. um, through atmospheric chemical reactions between the breakdown products of methane and the breakdown products of nitrogen. Basically, mm -hmm. if you zap a methane with UV ultraviolet, you can break up the methane you can make a, a radical. So that's a species that has an unpaired electron that's very reactive. Mm -hmm. That radical from methane will react with a nitrogen atom that's made from breaking up the nitrogen molecule. Nitrogen mm -hmm. And then it will make uh, hydrogen cyanide. And mm -hmm. that's the way it's made. And um, on the early Earth, you can have atmospheres, particularly uh, after large impacts, which have a lot of methane, they generate um, cyanides. The cyanide dissolves a little bit in rainwater. It mm -hmm. goes to the surface. Mm -hmm. And if it pools in a pond or a lake, that, that pond or lake can evaporate and the, the cyanide can concentrate. It can, concentrate. Bind, mm -hmm. it can mm -hmm. bind with iron to make ferrous cyanide and it becomes concentrated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, also, where does phosphorus come from? Well, on the Earth, it, it's in rocks and it dissolves out uh, when acids in rainwater or in rivers um, react with the rocks. It extracts the phosphorus, mm -hmm. but often it does not build up to high concentrations because calcium and phosphorus make a mineral yeah. called calcium phosphate, which is appetite. Appetite, which I you think I have it here. Well, you have it in your teeth. It's inside mm -hmm. your mouth as appetite. In your teeth <laughs> oh but that's also the mineral appetite right yeah. so that's calcium phosphate and it's insoluble and so if there's calcium dissolved in the water which often there is mm -hmm. and phosphate then they will they will make this insoluble mineral and so there's not much phosphate so that's a that's been called the phosphate problem of the origin of life in the past but it turns out that there are bodies of water, lakes that where phosphate is concentrated. Mm -hmm. And in those lakes, um, they're, they're sodium carbonate lakes. And basically mm -hmm. what happens is the calcium gets removed with carbonate to make calcium carbonate, which is another insoluble mineral. Mm -hmm. Calcium comes in various forms, but the typical one is known as limestone calcium carbonate or calcite yeah. calcium carbonate. And now in these lakes, there isn't much calcium. Um, and then any, any phosphorus that comes in from streams or from spring mm -hmm. water can build up and it can build up to levels that are suitable for prebiotic chemistry. Right. A lot of modern lakes, they have biology in them, of course. Everywhere you find water on the earth, naturally there's, there's, there's bugs there. And so they, they can remove phosphorus into and take it up into their their bodies so often phosphate is suppressed um by biology it's also. a lower bound what you measure yeah but there's the the most so we've been looking at the most phosphate rich lake in the world that we know of and it's in canada it's called last chance lake um mm -hmm. it's a small lake but the phosphate levels there build up to tens of millimolar whereas normally the level you find in lakes or in rivers is micromolar so one part per million but here it builds up to four orders of magnitude like larger yeah four orders of magnitude bigger which is significant and actually it's the kind of level that john sutherland tells me oh that will work for yeah. our prebiotic chemistry that kind of level and and these lakes we haven't even eliminated the biology because they have biology in yeah. them so if you could eliminate the biology, it's gonna the be phosphate would build up even higher yeah. because some phosphorus is removed into the organic yeah. phase. Um, but without the life, there would be even more phosphate and it would probably build right. up 
we estimate levels which are molar levels, like one molar phosphate, really concentrated. Mm -hmm. And that works perfectly for prebiotic chemistry. So anyway, for these reasons, I think the most promising environment for the origin of life is a surface body of water. There's another reason, which is there are lots. If you have land, you have lots of bodies of water. Yes. So you have many different varieties of chemistry, potentially. Right. Many different experiments, literally mm -hmm. maybe millions when you consider all the small ponds, lakes, puddles. Yeah, yeah. So just to summarize, you need cyanide and that comes from the gases like methane and nitrogen. Yeah. And from their, you know, high energy processing or like by UV light. Yeah. And then that dissolves and you need to concentrate it. So you need a wet dry cycle, which oh, takes the water fun. out, mm -hmm. right? And then increases the concentration, which is suitable in a lake environment. And yes. then the second element, like cyanide is sold. The next part was the phosphate, which you famously solved the phosphate problem by right. introducing this carbonate lake solution. Right. It's soda lakes, right? Like the, it's, they, it's tend like, to form, they tend to form soda lakes on the earth because sodium yeah. minerals are highly soluble. So the sodium builds up, the carbonate builds up. Yeah. Right. So basically when there is carbonate in the lake it kind of kills what precipitates like calcium what precipitates phosphate and you know then you don't have this ugly thing but no. you have dissolved phosphate which you need for your chemistry so yeah, those we... two problems are both sold by the surface and we have more we have more data to do with yeah. the the lakes because we've been studying them intensively with we've, we've been up there three times we've taken samples and we have lots of data which we haven't published yeah. yet basically all the data supports this hypothesis about the yeah. calcium being removed and suppressing the appetite yeah. uh, precipitation so we can i think when we publish this data it will pretty much prove the argument that, that it, the chemistry works um yeah. the the stuff about cyanide concentrating of course that's more from models because we don't have the kind of atmosphere today that makes cyanide right. but we did we can we can model that for the ancient earth but we do have this example of titan that although it's colder and different it, it does demonstrate the basic uh the basic history of cyanide yeah. formation and also the production of bigger molecules with with cyanide and then the, the, the great advantage of cyanide is that it has this ability to attack mm -hmm. carbon containing molecules and add in carbon right. and nitrogen and then do it again and again and again and eventually if you make a long molecule containing lots of mm -hmm. carbon and nitrogen it can spontaneously cyclize mm -hmm. so make a like a benzene ring but it's it's called a heterocycle because it's not just all carbon it's carbon and some the atoms in the ring are mm -hmm. nitrogen that's exactly what we have in the genetic molecules, right? We right. have heterocyclic rings containing mm -hmm. carbon and nitrogen atoms. Mm -hmm. And that's what you get from this cyanide chemistry. So it's a very natural way that, that surely happens or happened on the early earth to make um, to make these genetic molecules. Well, it would be interesting if on Titan, there's also these um, heterocyclic uh, molecules, molecules when mm -hmm. that's measured. I mean, there is a mission going to Titan now called Dragonfly. It's mm -hmm. a drone with a quadcopter drone. Yeah. So it'll fly around. Yeah. To take measurements like there was on it. Mars. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Perfect. So, so I think that was on my plate. Just like before we close, like just in, you don't, you don't have to justify it. Like just in a few sentences, according to you, what are the biggest remaining challenges? Because I mean, cyanide, problem seems to be solved phosphate problem seems to be solved by you well i mean at least well, we have a good explanation that we can yeah so it. like what are the remaining biggest challenges what do you think in the in the field just a few sentences before we close okay well i mean the 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 biggest problems in astrobiology mm -hmm. are the origin of life and whether there's life elsewhere, okay? Those are the two mm -hmm. big problems. 
Whether there's life elsewhere, that's a detection problem. Right. Okay. And, you know, I, you can think of, our, of astrobiology as being the origin of evolution of life on Earth and its possible variety elsewhere, or, or, or more simply, life in a cosmic context. Mm -hmm. And the way that we can approach that problem is four ways. There's, you, can, you can look at life on Earth and the origin of life on Earth. Mm -hmm. You can look at life, the possibility of life in the solar system. You can look at exoplanets. So that's number three. We can look at possibility of life on exoplanets. There's a fourth way, which is search for extraterrestrial intelligence, looking for radio signals or yeah. laser signals, whatever. Those are the four approaches, and they encapsulate all of them. Well, the first, the first one encapsulates the problem of the origin of life but also whether life is elsewhere depends on the origin of life if yeah. the origin of life is vanishingly small then the prospects are not very good but you know i remain optimistic and it's possible that, that there's lots of bacteria like life throughout the milky way it's just we don't have the technology yet with the telescopes to detect it so the big the big problem with the origin of life is that we have these little bits and pieces that yeah. are solved, but um, there's still, how do you get from the prebiotic chemistry to a functioning protocell? Yeah. So the protocell would have a membrane, but exactly what kind of membrane and how it, how it interacts with amino acids and peptides and, and, um, and also the, the, the genetic molecules and how that, self-replicating entity works, works is, yeah. is not solved um so that's a big problem um and then with the other issues about the detection of life um i think we still need to get these samples back from mars and see whether there really was life on mars at all that's a big a big issue mm -hmm. uh, it's possible that tomorrow or the next week or two weeks time perseverance rover could could see something like a structure yeah. that, that's a stromatolite who knows yeah. but it hasn't seen that so far and i think you know i think probably mars never had photosynthetic life and that's the issue because if it had photosynthesis you might see what we call black shales so black shales are carbon rich fine grain mm -hmm. sediments which you see on the earth quite commonly yeah and the carbon is all made by photosynthesis. But if, if Mars never got as far as photosynthesis, the life would be much simpler, chemosynthetic life, mm -hmm. that's harder to find and detect, especially if it's dead and extinct. Mm -hmm. So that may be a problem for Mars. Mm -hmm. uh, we still need to understand the range and variety of exoplanet atmospheres. Uh, James Webb Telescope will give us some information, but it's very limited to mm -hmm. just transmission spectroscopy of planets around mm -hmm. um, red dwarfs essentially the future for that field i think lies in two things which are the ground-based telescopes the big extremely large telescopes where you can have a special instrument maybe looks at a very narrow wavelength that might tell yeah. you whether there's oxygen or methane or whatever co2 in a in an exoplanet atmosphere and maybe that Maybe life could be discovered that way. It remains to be seen. And then also the next generation telescope after James Webb, where you can directly image an Earth-like planet. Then you could find life that's like, you could find a twin of the Earth, yeah. or you could find the twin of the Archean Earth, the ancient Earth, when there was a different biosphere. So that's where the field is headed. But, but you know, the problem with this, with science and this field is, you know, some things are not predictable. There can be discoveries. So I mentioned SETI. Supposing in two weeks' time somebody just finds a SETI signal. Everything you never know. Changes. Yeah. Yeah, then everything changes. Then it means there's intelligent life out there. One thing I would say is that if you do find a SETI signal, unless it's directed, if it's just a random signal that you you've in you've yeah you just happen to have intercepted uh we may we may not know what it means i mean we just be may be able to see that it's clearly 
um, technological because it's encoded or frequency encoded or something. Yeah. But it may be unintelligible. And there are analogies, right? For example, linear A, which is an ancient hieroglyphic <laughs> script that has never been decoded. That mm. was made by humans. And yet we don't, we can't decode it. So if we have something made by non-human extraterrestrials, it's not clear to me that we will be able to decode uh, what, what it means, means. Yeah. Unless it's a deliberate signal saying, hey, no. we're here. <laughs> yeah. But if it's not deliberate, if it's just intercepted, it could just be this mystery right. that um, people on the internet will talk about for years about <laughs> what it means and various speculations. But right. it would still be a game changer because we know that when technological civilization is not alone, that there's somebody else. Right. Out. So that's terrifying. Yeah. Is it well, or yeah. is it or is yeah. it something else? Is it like is it joyful or is it terrifying? <laughs> I think it's both at the same time. Like it's it's it, it can change everything, right? Like, like it, it's a whole different level of um, enemy. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but they might be friends. <laughs> well, yeah, but like it, just like imagine contacting. Um, a tribe right like and and we we know that like it often doesn't go right and no this is one argument that yeah. you know whenever we've seen technologically advanced civilizations come into contact with people who are less technologically it's... advanced it, it, it exactly it's, it's that's what bad. happens that's usually <laughs> what happens but that that's like a human human history right like we don't know what yeah. is the history of the other kind and and also like humans amongst themselves will start debating because then the religions have to come up with their own explanations and they will right they may or may not like the signal and they may or may not like the future work on that so that will create like an internal battle yeah i don't know it's it's a big big thing of course yeah well it's a possibility yeah. i mean yeah yeah well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, David. This I know that this this went a little bit beyond the timeline that we imagined, but I think it just flew. So okay. I get two hours instead but, of one hour. <laughs> so it, it was perfect. Uh, okay. Thank you so much for being my guest in, in my YouTube channel. And yeah, thank you. Okay. Well, I'm sure I'll see you in the future at some Origin of Life conference yeah <laughs> maybe in september right if there's one at harvard that would be fun yeah yeah i'm just gonna stop the recording <laughs>